So David, thank you so much for coming back on the show. We were just, you were just showing me the video that you showed that, or that you recorded to you telling your employees what had happened. And it just sparked an emotional response for me because I, I've told some people on this show, but like I went home, dude, and I sat on the edge of my bed and I bawled and I literally had my wife sit next to me. And it was just like, like two, like so many different emotions at the same time. Like I literally just was shutting down. And I, so it was like hard to identify like what emotion I was trying to <laughs> process and like, so why don't let's just kick it off like with what you were just showing me and then we can go back and we're going to get into all the technical natures of what you did, why you did it, how the, how it all unfolded. But like, just explain what you were just showing me, man. That was awesome. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, that was, a that I was present to along my entrepreneurial journey was trying to be more in the moment and, and appreciative. And, and maybe we talked about this a little bit on the last phone call uh, on the last uh, uh, session, but like, for example, the day that, that I went and I actually sold Dreamwater to Walmart, it was just like another day for me. But as I was maturing well into my 30s, I sold at 38 um, and I'm 41 now. But I tried to have this sort of idea that I should be more present and conscious to the good, bad or indifferent sort of along the way. Right. You know, that saying, the you know, the good old days. Well, somebody put it into my head that these are the good old days all the time. Right. And it was funny because. And we're sort of starting here at the at the end of this. We're starting this session sort of at the end. But one of my uncles, and again, I come from a very entrepreneurial family. I remember one of my uncles telling me, you're never going to forget like when you're in the shit, like that grind, you know, like <laughs> when you were in the library studying until whatever hour, you know, for that big test or, or whatever, like that's what you're going to remember. And I remember thinking like, because most days sucked, you know, and, and, and they're <laughs> difficult and what have you. And I remember thinking like, this, this is what I'm going to remember. This is what I'm going to, but sure enough, you know, looking backwards, you, you remember the grind, you know, you remember staying in that office for getting that presentation just right, or making sure that you're able to book everything you need to book or, or whatever, whatever the things are. Right. And then also this idea of being very present, like, you know, your first reaction after I, I sort of stopped the recording was, I wish I had that. And I was like, I'm proud of myself for being more present to, we got into the room as I'm about to announce this transaction. I hadn't slept in like legit three days. Uh, although one of the three nights was because I was too excited to go to sleep. Um, I was say, and you sell dream water. So like, there's a lot of questions. It was a lot of stuff. And I'm not, a, I'm not outwardly a super emotional person. I don't really cry. And you're seeing me cry in that video. And as I start to think, and I, I started and ended my thank yous, at least on that moment with, uh, uh, we'll get into gratitude here. I'm sure as part of this conversation, but um, I started and ended that, moment just really you know thinking and appreciating my parents my dad and my mom uh in different ways and i still get emotional when i see that video but i'm, I'm just proud of the fact that i had told my dad literally as we're getting into the room like pa just video this so it's not the best quality video or anything like that but i was like pa just just turn it on because i'm about to tell people that i just sold my baby and so yeah that's what we were coming off of and then you said man i wish i would have had that and i'm like i'm patting myself on the back like yes you know i i was more present i have that now to look back at you know so let's let's continue with this. What emotions were you feeling and why were you crying? And you said selling your baby. Just explain to someone that has never done what you just showed me. And like, why was it so emotional and what were you experiencing? So we're going to tell this story a little out of order, which is okay. Um, I like it. <laughs> but so we'll start, we'll start with that moment that we can go backwards. It's important to sort of acknowledge that every deal has its ebbs and flows, right? And, and uh, you know, from sourcing it to getting into a signed term sheet to going through the diligence to, to getting the purchase agreement in place, you know, all of those moments, it, you know, it has a life of its own. And some days you're like, at one point, you know, we sold and it was announced on May 3rd of 2018. And so mid-March through May 3rd of 2018, I I didn't have days, nights, weekends. It was just what needed to happen between now and the next you know, whatever, half a day. And so, you know, you're going through like a month and a half of that. It's getting more intense as you're, as you're getting closer to sort of that announcement day, that, that, that what have you. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the key takeaways when I, when I give my entrepreneurial talks is, um, and it's going to seem a little overly obvious is that it's not done until it's done. And, and, uh, what that means is I was the lead negotiator. I was the lead legal. Uh, I am a bar certified attorney. 
I was the, the head legal, head diligence, uh, head negotiator. Um, it's in reverse. I don't necessarily recommend that because then technically I get to go to work for these people. And when I actually layered in our corporate attorney, I had already, you know, usually it's the attorneys that play the, the bad guy role and you're supposed to be the good guy. And I was like, you're the good guy. Now I'm the bad guy because that's how this thing has been set up. Uh, again, we can get into those nuances a little, you know, as, as we progress through this, uh, this session, but so we're getting toward the end and it was me, my attorney, and there was two major Canadian law firms. We sold to a Canadian cannabis, publicly traded Canadian cannabis company. There was two major Canadian law firms up there and the, the lead of the bigger one, who was the lead on the, on the transaction on their side, it was me, him and my attorney at like, I'm not exaggerating, like 1130 midnight, somewhere around that time period going over the details because we had to, they had a board vote on May 2nd. Remember the deal was announced on May 3rd, but the plan was that they had a board vote on May 2nd, first thing in the morning. Then they would halt the stock because it was publicly traded up in Canada on the TSC, Toronto Stock Exchange. They were going to halt the stock, then make the announcement, but they couldn't tell me exactly what it was, when it was going to be. And I did apparently manage to keep the entirety of this transaction a relative secret from everybody in the company. Um, I didn't want it to be a distraction. So on, 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 on that moment at midnight, we were basically planning the logistics of the day of, like what was going to happen in a couple hours. So for example, they had a, a public relations person out in Vancouver. <laughs> you couldn't be farther, you know, three hours behind. But basically I had to wake up like at 5 a.m. and bang out the last versions of the draft with, with that person at, at their 2 a.m., so that the, the actual release can be approved by the board in that board vote and so on and so forth. And I'm getting, get, I'm getting a little too much in the weeds, but I remember having to wake up. So, we, you know, we're going over the logistics and I made some joke. I made some joke. The thing's done. We're not negotiating. There's nothing else to negotiate. There, there's nothing there. But I made some joke like that. I, you know, you didn't need to do that on the transaction. And, you know, you want a little bit too much over there or whatever. But it was a joke. And we had, like I said, for a month and a half or more, just been very intimately grinding all together, including their counsel, right? Mm -hmm. And so I made that joke and they couldn't tell me the time frame. So in the morning I said, guys, I, I sent sort of a company-wide email uh, and not just to the company employees. I sent it to key shareholders, people that mattered, advisors, you know, like whatever. Hey, um, you know, contractors yeah. that mattered. I was like, hey guys, uh, you know, I just want to have like sort of a state of the union kind of, you know, I didn't make it a big deal, but I've never called one of these before. But it was very important that my people find out from me, not from somebody else that were doing the transaction, right? I call this meeting. And in theory, this is supposed to happen in the morning on May 2nd. Hey, the board should have broken, broken out by now. You know, they should have been done with their meeting and all that stuff, whatever. And long story short, because of my stupid fucking joke, that was so inconsequential and so dumb. It's just like you, you, you think it's done, right? It's, right? it's totally done. I never got the phone call. I, I thought, oh, my God, what's happening? My aunt, actually, one of my aunts was having a huge party. Then. And I was like, how convenient that I get to announce this thing and then party with everybody without it costing me a dime. You know, like, and it's yeah, going to be a big party. Right there. It was going to be amazing. Like, this whole thing was set up to be fantastic. My principal guy that I was dealing with up in Canada, not the lawyer, calls me. He says, fuck, David, what did you do? You fucked up the whole thing. So here I am killing myself. I think that the whole thing is done. I make a dumb, I've negotiated this thing perfectly. Like Philharmonic level conducting, you know, like it <laughs> couldn't have been better. And, and a stupid joke at the end equals, then I think there's no transaction to be had. I just scared my whole company for no reason up until that point. That, so that night that we were planning logistics, one of the nights that I didn't sleep was because I, I was so excited. I said, man, for all of the seven, eight years of this journey, you don't really tangibly dream of this moment, but it's here today. Today, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to go to the office, and I'm going to announce that I sold my company you know, to these people that I live with, that I grind with, that I do all of these things. Today is the day. So that was like one of the nights out of excitement that I didn't sleep, right? That was the, the only thing. Turns into going to this, I don't go to my aunt's party. My twin brother and my younger brother come over to the house. We drink a lot of whiskey. They console me. I think I completely fucked this thing up. I'm in a bizarre days. And that night I couldn't sleep because, you know, as you get older, you can't sleep so well when you drink alcohol. It sits right here. But also I couldn't sleep because I was like, man, I think I really fucked this whole thing up. I go to the office the next day, kind of like in a daze, and I don't really know what's going on. And then all of a sudden, I don't know if they're going to call me, if they're not going to, well, what's happening? And then all of a sudden in like the mid to late morning, 
I get a phone call. David, it's on. You can announce your company. It's happening. So like, what the fuck? I didn't have to change it. I don't know what happened, whatever. But that's why it happened on May 3rd instead of May 2nd. And and I got that phone call. And then that's that video that you saw. But it was like, like, like on a whim. Like I didn't call a shareholder meeting. Not everybody who I wanted to be on that call was there because I wasn't going to fuck that up again, you know? And hey, Pops, you're, uh, turn on your phone, man. I'm, I'm recording well, this. <laughs> my mom wasn't even there. I had, I had my mom dial in, you know? So... Yeah, so that that's so that's what that emotions were you so a lot other than the roller coaster that you just described, which again we'll go unpack some of the stuff prior to that 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 emotional roller coaster. But in that moment, moment, David, what emotions were going through you and why? And like, so what was the experience like? I think I was thinking to myself, I need to sleep. No pun intended, because of dream water, but you know if you ever really push yourself and I'm not exaggerating, like if I got one to two hours over a three, three plus day experience where that was so technical in nature, you know, sleep is very important for your cognitive abilities, you know, stress management, whatever. But I think I was, I think if we're going to say in the moment, I think I was just fully fucking exhausted. Like I drained the tank and, and, and all that stuff. And, and also keep in mind that the, the transaction didn't close until May 29th. They had until May 31st to close it. They, they actually wired and finished it on, on you know, by the end of the month because the Toronto Stock Exchange had to sign off on this, uh, you know, on the transaction and what have you. And so that, there was a contingency around that. So it still wasn't real for me. You know, it still wasn't like, you know, anything really changed. And again, I hadn't been wired. Now, what, what I can say is on the day of wiring on May 29th of 2018, I remember that I went with my friend. Uh, who who is an influencer in the cannabis space or whatever? He was speaking at a, uh, a a pretty interesting conference down in South Beach. So he happened to invite me, and he says, "Hey, come hang out with me. I'm going to be on a panel, you know, whatever." And I wanted to be out of the office and sort of distracted, right? So I said, "Okay, I'll go hang out." With you. South Beach at a cannabis conference equals what I I would call distracted. <laughs> yes, uh, I needed that, right? Like, uh, and then there was reasons to it because the very limited reps and warranties. Um, that existed in this in this deal existed between the announcement and the closing so like in that three week time span or three plus week time span and it was all tied to my knowledge so within reason and again i can get into the particulars here i I didn't want to know anything of what was happening or not happening good bad or indifferent because the the very limited reps and warranties you know and Mm -hmm. indemnification was tied to my knowledge my actual knowledge so i'm out there and i get a phone call from my mom and she says have you seen your bank account and i said i said no, 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 I haven't. And and that's how I knew that the wire happened. My mom called me and was like, have you seen your bank account? Um, she's your controller or bookkeeper, right? Like, so she's, she wasn't even the controller or bookkeeper. She was always the person that we trusted with cash. So in all of our businesses, she was, I, I didn't write. The treasury. Yeah, 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 yeah. She she was in my account, you know, corporate or personal. Um, yeah. We did that on purpose because it's, it's more efficient if you have somebody that you can trust that isn't going to steal from you that, let them do, deal with a wire transfer. Let them deal with reconciliation, not me. Uh, and it was my mom. And and she always did that. So it was very positive. So that's why she even knew to tell me or to call me. And anyway, so so in that moment, I looked down at my phone. I'm at this uh, conference. I'm actually at the pool out in the SLS, I think it was at, uh, in South Beach. And then I um, I put my phone away and I went about my day. But being sort of paying attention to that as my feelings and all that stuff, whatever, what that sort of reinforced for me was that for me, and I'm not saying this because it sounds nice to say out loud, it really was about the experience, the journey, and all of those things. And I was present to that as, as, as a thought, not about the money, because th- that wiring and, and it being more money than I've ever had in my personal bank account and, and all that stuff, whatever, it didn't absolutely in any way change one thing that I didn't go on a trip the next day. I was literally in the office the next day. That, that was a, a two, three hour excursion out of the office to go s- support my friend and distract myself because I didn't know when that wire was going to hit or, or how or whatever. So, you know, for me, at least it said it wasn't about the money and not in a way like a badge of honor. Right. It was just right. it sort of validated for myself that it was about the journey, the experience and all that stuff more than anything else. Well, and I want to tie it to um, what you had said on the last um, interview is, you know, you like solving complicated shit. And we had talked about the three components or legs of the stool or however you want to call it, which is enjoy work, create wealth, have an impact. And so you and you had also told the story about 
you know, not recognizing and not having as many, um, you know, celebrating the wins. And so like with this, like when I watch that video and you're crying and you're, you're emotional and, you know, definitely there's some exhaustion there, but like, did you feel like you made it? And when you, when you have this thing, that's this journey, which I, cause I totally agree with you, David. Like I live the same way. Like my kids ask me like, what's your favorite part of the day? I'm like the whole thing the whole journey you can't have the day without the night and it's all relevant. most of it sucks is the key yeah, yeah. exactly and besides this moment while i'm kissing you good no but um you know did you like when you did, made it and in here and i'm trying to unpack a very complicated topic here that i think a lot of people struggle with that are entrepreneurs which is i can't i'm going to defer gratification until i make it or i'm gonna like you know when am i going to realize the wins or you know pat myself on the back but like how did you, you said to your baby that you sold and I don't even know where the question resides in this. I hear you. I think I have an answer. I'll say it in two ways. Um, on the one hand, I come from a very entrepreneurial family. Um, and I'm the oldest of my generation. A lot of kids, a lot of first cousins and in, you know, siblings and what have you. And the phone calls I got from my uncles upon the announcement, they didn't know what I was working on or whatever my dad knew, uh, but they didn't know. That felt fucking awesome and fantastic. Yes. But it felt awesome and fantastic because I've always gravitated toward being around them and listening to them. Like even when I was little and there would be a family dinner or barbecue or whatever, like I would sit with my dad and my uncles and just listen to them and, and talk to them. And here I am, you know, getting on the board. But that's really what it was. Like I got on the board, um, but I didn't I wouldn't say I felt like a success or anything like that. I, I, I think I got on the board and that was sort of like a monkey off my back, like. I've always been inclined to do this. I've always envisioned cool, big things for me or whatever. Um, this is at least a notch on the belt because within reason, relative to my uncles that are all self-made uh, and my dad, especially, my win was very small in comparison. to them. So again, at least I got on the board. My immediate thought was I got to do it again to prove that it was not a fluke, right? Like I don't let myself celebrate, I guess, is these things. And But I will tell you that those conversations were 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 awesome and I'm not easy at getting or receiving sort of praise or, or congratulations or or I'm not good at like my own birthday, you know, things like that. But that was emotional. It was cool. And um again, I didn't view it as yay, I'm successful. I viewed it as like at least I got on the board. Let's keep going. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. The other thing I was going to say around that was I'm a part of an entrepreneurial group called EO, Entrepreneurs Organization. So if you've heard of EO or YPO, it's all sort of the same construct. Yep, yep. The core of it is that you have a forum. It's the same group of people, usually around eight people that you meet every single month. You cannot miss a meeting and it's every month for at least four hours. Um, and it's, you're meeting with like-minded people, similarly situated that can experience share with one another around the things that we have going on. And you do so in a very intimate way with super high levels of confidentiality. And the idea is that you go into your forum and you talk about the things that you would never acknowledge or talk about with any other human. Um, at its highest form, we say that that's a 1% share, a 5% share, the stuff that's really there for you, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, around your business, family, or personal. Um, I share all that to say that my EO forum, I was in EO at that point about seven years or so, or whatever it was, my EO forum lived all of that experience with me, all of the dream water journey with me. And so one of the places that I felt most excited to celebrate wasn't even with my employees, wasn't even with my shareholders. It was with this sort of peer group of, of, of EO and, uh, and say, look, we were able to do this together. You know, we got through this together. The experience was there. So there was a lot of, it, it felt very complete. I'm sorry, the reason why I bring up EO in terms of my feelings around that, that moment or a moment of success is I was very complete with my journey. Did I think Dreamwater was going to be a much bigger outcome from a financial success and from an exit perspective and from a revenue perspective? In every way, I thought Dreamwater was going to be a lot bigger. But all things considered, it was a pretty amazing outcome. And... Um, it was a pretty amazing outcome. And I worked through it knowing while I was going through these, like I told you, a month and a half of not sleeping or two months of not sleeping. And I, well, I was prepared. I was resolved because Dreamwater and my daughter, my firstborn are the same age. They, I started them both at the same time, you know, yeah, my yeah. daughter and gestation. So it really, in every way, was like I'm, I'm losing a baby, you know, or whatever. But I was very, very complete. And we can get into specifics of that if you want. But I was very complete with my journey such that my hope and wish was that they can take it and blow it up and make it even bigger. But even if they don't, it sort of validates that I was doing the whole thing. So I was like, I was very clear that this was a win-win. If it, if it got better, if it got worse, you know, like I was good. Right. So I was very complete. And that's what let me do that. 
and and I appreciate how the, your choice of words, David, because um, I think I, I think we said in the last session that um, the 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 book that triggered me into my journey was Bo Burlingham's Finish Big, and after you know all these entrepreneurs that he interviewed, he talked about like when he sums it all up, he's like the people that were the happiest knew who they were, what they wanted from their business and why. And when they exited, they were proud of the outcome and they felt like they were treated fair along the way. And those are easy sentences to say, David, but you and I know that the mechanical and just the the, the grind to get to that outcome is very hard because there's introspective work to know who you are, what you want. And then you know that you got to know the technical work to make sure that you don't get effed in the reps and warranties or the deal structure or like, you know, all the other stuff. And this is kind of like, I think it's an interesting, uh, and it's, we're encapsulating kind of my mission here. We're like, you need to know the emotion and the technical in order to be happy and proud of your outcome. And when, I, when, when I reached out with, uh, to you, which is again, I very much enjoy these conversations because we talk a lot about the emotional and introspective work, but you have a lot of technical background, like you said, Right. Like you went through and you formalized all this academia or you went into academia to understand how to get the outcome that you wanted. And so maybe this is a great bridge to kind of go back into kind of the we can talk about these milestones, but you know, being conscious of the time of, you know, having yeah, sure. another 30, 45 minutes is it's the triggering event that because you were talking about the grind growing, you know, barely recognizing that you're going to get into Walmart to why did you decide to go down the deal train? And then we'll, we can talk about the deal train and the technical aspects to get you how you got what you wanted. So what, what, what shifted you from the grind to, hey, this, I should maybe hand this off at some point? Nothing shifted me from the grind to maybe I should hand this off. What happened, what happened was is that I was sort of very present to the fact that my job as a CEO. So I never wanted to be the CEO, a certain type of CEO. I wanted, like, there's some people that are great at like starting something. There's some people that are great at turnarounds and bankruptcy stuff. And there's some people that are great at managing huge organizations, mid-sized organizations. I never wanted to be one type of CEO, you know, when I was 29 or 30 starting Dreamwater. And so I wanted to be able to sort of evolve into my role. And one of the things I was very present to is the CEO. What the hell does CEO mean, right? One of the things that I thought was an important part of my job was to always be networking into, in my case, the CPG, private equity or institutional financing world and strategics. So when I would go to trade shows, a lot of my friends, even though I would love to hang out with the Walmart folks or the Walgreens folks, or whatever, I was hanging out with a lot of folks at Johnson Johnson, you know, or, you know, the higher level people or the uh, M&M Mars or, you know, you name it, some of these big, big organizations, right? Potential strategic acquirers. Huh? I mean, always, yeah. always just, I just viewed it as core to my job whether I was fundraising or not fundraising, whether I was looking to exit or not looking to exit, building those relationships. And with the strategics, it goes a lot further because whenever something would happen at Walgreens, you know, we, I had somebody I can call and say, is that what you're hearing? Are you seeing that? I didn't just rely on my own sales reps or my brokers or my own sort of, you know, inquiries. Like when you're able to sort of foster that, you know, you have, you have better Intel, you know, more real-time Intel, more support, if you will. Um, and so I always viewed interacting with strategics or private equity or institutional capital, like as part, a core part of my job, not because I was fundraising in that moment, be, because I never took a dollar of in, what I would call institutional capital. It's always high net worth individuals, at least in the dream order side of the journey. And so that never came to be, but it, it never minimized my interactions with some of these huge private equity firms. When I had spoken to some strategics, you know, along the way, I thought that maybe something would happen. Nothing ever came to it by way of transaction. And, and then all of a sudden, I think, we referenced this in the in the first session of our of our chat. I I was at a point where my Canadian distributor really wasn't doing much for me, and I was considering in the summer of 2017 how to sort of just terminate that agreement. I was doing the sales calls, I was doing the production, I was doing the regulatory, I was handling their Amazon account. Like in every way, I was doing it. so. I was like, I don't really need them, and it wasn't to make more money. It was just more like, why do I have to continue to interact with their team? I can just do it my way, right? Which I'm doing anyway. And I never got to the point of saying that a lot. In fact, I might not, you know, if, if, if Steve or anybody hears this, this might be the first time that they hear me say it like this bluntly or directly. But all of a sudden, this guy, Steve, from my Canadian distributorship, uh, emails me an unsolicited term sheet. I suppose that academically you can run a process and you can then hire a banker and help you understand these things and, and whatever. But in, in an overly simplistic statement, 
I have been so underwhelmed by so many investment bankers from big firms, small firms that I can't even begin to describe that to you, right? Like, and even on the institutional equity side, like when they would list the people that they interact with and that they know and all this stuff, whatever, I actually knew them. So I would be able to say, oh, what do you, oh, that guy? Great. What do you, you know, what do you, like, I knew way, th- th- that was just another name on a list for them. Like for me, it was like, I actually know who these people are and I interact with them. Anyway, so, so, um, you know, then you'd say, oh, let me run a process and maximize, you know, the, the, the outcome and, and leverage one offer for another. And that just never really occurred to me. Again, I was always out there. So it's not like I thought that there was a million opportunities. It wasn't like I was gangbusters, like, you know, killing it. Like I can dictate my own terms or whatever. And I saw this and I said, but you know, he doesn't know my financials. He doesn't know what I'm going through. So how did he really know how to put together a term sheet? But it wasn't t- terribly off. And, you know, I flew up to Toronto and I met with some of his people. And But by Thanksgiving, with no sort of pressure or what, no, nothing, we got the term sheet into a um, into a good place where it was executable would and safe. Been, Let's go. Would this have been, been uh, Thanksgiving 2017 then? If you yes. Know. Yes. Okay. Um, so it was in around that that we got the term sheet into place. And for me, I like to do all my negotiating into the term sheet such that once you've done that. Now it's just about papering it and executing against the transaction. I don't want to go down that deep path of due diligence. I don't want to go down the path of remotely letting my employees know that this can happen because I don't want them to check out. I don't want them to question. I don't want them to start to search for jobs like, oh, what's going to happen? I don't want to deal with any of that stuff because it's already a distraction for me. And we have a business to run independent of a transaction. And we have things that we have to do. And I don't even want to distract myself, much less have the risk of anybody on my team being distracted or anything like that. So I have all those thoughts in my head going on and, and really all I want to do is get in and out of the transaction, you know, sort of as fast as possible and then, you know, go forward the right way. So that was really what was present to me, you, you know, and very important to me in, in this whole thing. And that's also why it was so important for me to do all the negotiating in the term sheet. Every time that they tried to renegotiate, I said, guys, I already did my negotiating. It was, it was right there. It was right there. We already did it. Yeah. No, oh, so many, I love it, dude. And, so what I'm hearing is the level of confidence that I want every listener listening in right now to have when they go through their eventual situation, whatever it is. And so here's, here's some of the, the questions I have. I don't know how to, let me think how to phrase my, so like, if you think about, I'm very familiar with EO cause I've been presenting to EO forums for quite a while, looking to actually join the Minnesota chapter and like very, you know, been part of this. We welcome you, Ryan. We welcome you. Yeah. <laughs> I have to go get interviewed. Right. But uh, <laughs> so the, the, uh, but so like, I think David now put yourself, so you're entrepreneur family. Like you, you covered that in the, the, in part one entrepreneur family, you've been learning about this. You don't, you don't, you, you just kind of have the, I'm crazy as shit DNA and, but you understand valuations, the deal structure, and you know the technical background because your background and because your family. So now you're sitting across from your forum and you think about, and I don't know if you just trained up your forum over the course of, you know, 12 years or something like that, but the people that have been on my show, and I think about Ryan Tansom and Corey Tansom 10 years ago, we didn't know all the stuff that you knew that you knew. I don't, I'm not impressed by investment bankers. I talked to the BE firms. I'm going to negotiate my own F and deal because I know the legal structure and I know the financial structure. Like that's the confidence I want people to have. But when people don't know this, what I tend to see, David, is that the emotions, over, like they hijack the frontal cortex and like people just get so emotional. They can't wait to sign the deal because they think it's like a, you know, they don't know how to, how to value. They don't know what they have is valuable and how to judge the rep. They don't understand the importance of reps and warranties and indemnification. So like it's all backs. Yeah. Yeah, man. And like said, the last comment on is it's, it's my technical knowledge now that I believe gives me the confidence to not get sucked into all the bullshit. And so like how, like when you're sitting across from your forum or the people listening, how do you bridge the gap of like, to get that level of confidence, how did you talk to your forum about how to handle it? Or how, what would you have suggested your forum about hiring investment bankers or like the whole deal structure? Cause it's, it's a hard deal, man, to keep the emotions separate. I think it starts with some sort of level of honesty with yourself. What, what do you feel like, you know, what, what do you feel like you don't know and how to, how to find the gaps in there. And it's not necessarily that I'm overly confident, although I probably was, it was more like, it's just, this is what makes logical sense to me. And to some degree, if, if you recall in our first session, um, you know, I was talking about like, I was not 
I was able to go into Walmart and it was just like another day the first time I sold to Walmart because I wasn't intimidated by what that meant. Deep into my dream water journey, I was probably more intimidated by walking into those Walmart or Walgreens or CVS meetings than I was at the beginning because I just, I didn't know to be intimidated. I didn't know to be scared or lack of, lack any confidence. It's just what made logical sense to me, be it on the selling to Walgreens or Walmart or CVS or selling your company to somebody. Now, part of what allowed me to have that confidence is my business was in decent enough shape, right? Again, on a personal level, and we talked, we touched on this in the, the last talk, I had a safety net, which is my, my dad, right? Like, so, so if all hell breaks loose and nothing, nothing happens, at least I won't be out on the street and starving the next day. And, um, and then, like I said, I negotiated all the things that were important to me inside my term sheet. And, and that included things like, for example, we set a February 15th closing date from Thanksgiving to then. They hadn't done an ounce of diligence. But, but for example, when I told you I wanted to get in and out of a transaction very fast, it wasn't a legal thing. It wasn't a confidence or an experience or academic thing. I was just like, I want to be in and out. Can you do this? How quickly can you do this? So it was me asking questions over the course of a couple months of negotiating this term sheet, you know, can you do a quick close? Because I knew in this specific case, a lot of this is also asking questions and really understanding the drivers and the intentions of the acquirer or the merger partner or what have you. So my thing is not to negotiate for what I want. It's to ask questions to understand what they want so that whatever it is that I'm thinking, be it structure, valuation, um, you know, speed of transaction, you know, what we're going to cover by way of diligence and, and when and how long, whatever those things are, I was very, I was very clear on it because whatever I was suggesting was not just because it worked for David. It was really rooted in me asking them a bunch of questions that ultimately formed my logic, my thinking, my thought process. And so, for example, yeah, I wanted to close it the next day, right? Because I didn't want to have an interruption. I didn't want to have anything sort of distracting, including distracting of myself. I didn't want to have a prolonged, you know, back and forth. But it was really that, 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 that Steve ultimately said, yeah, we'll close it in that moment by February 15th. Um, I'm surprised he didn't ask me why February 15th, because in theory, I would have said February 28th, you know, end of the month type things or whatever. But it was my birthday. My birthday is February 15th. And so and to this day, he never asked me. And so when I sort That's of got to pick a date, I'm like, can you close by February 15th? What I really wanted to do originally in that time frame was have an awesome thing to celebrate on my birthday, right? Yeah. I want I want a wire chat. I want a wire with multiple commas for my birthday, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I thought it would be cool, and he didn't push back on that or, or anything like that. Now, what was very important to me? Well, I'll take a pause there, but that was basically yeah. that. And there's, I'll get into some of the structuring aspects because that also gave me confidence. Um, right, and and, and 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 I'll let you keep going, but I just wanted to, yeah, like you said, for the pause is just connect the dot of. Like it's the technical knowledge that brings the confidence. It doesn't mean you have to use it. It's like in sales, man. Like you, you could have all the formulas of how dream waters work, but you're trying to sell it in and they're not going to care about the, you know, all the technical stuff until they figure out the emotions. And like, but I think you, you like people forget that there's both. Right. And so you have to like the technical knowledge gives you the ability to ask the right questions, to lead you the right direction, to form your logic. And that's, and what, you're, but you're giving even that too much, Credence to academics, and I hate to say that out loud because I don't think that that's where you're trying to go, but it's just what made sense to me, right? Like, yeah. and not even because of an academic thing, it was because I was asking them questions and saying, okay, now I kind of, I think I understand what their motivations are either on a grand scale or on specific items. And, and I try to very transparently communicate what's there for me mm -hmm. and find that me meeting of the mind in a way that works and the reason why I say, you know, investment makers and whatever is because a lot of times they're not, they're way more formulaic about it. Um, no, yeah, no creativity. It's just like, this is how it's done, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, here's your discount on cash flow. Here's your product. Like, right. like, and then and the same thing with attorneys. However, like, I think it's maybe say it a different way because you're right. It, like, it, this is not about the academics, but it's about the, it's about how the shit works. And so like the reason when everybody will say, hey, if you've never been through a transaction, call an entrepreneur that's been through a transaction. That doesn't mean they're an investment banker, an attorney or a CPA, but they just know like, do not sign an employment contract or an earn out like this because you're going to get fucked. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, oh, good. Didn't even know what an earn out was. Didn't know that there was a difference between an employment sure. contract and the purchase price. So it's, it's like, it's like, dude, I guess like said in the easiest way ever is like, man, like the people that have never been through a transaction. And when I try to describe it, it's like almost like trying someone that's enlightened, trying to describe someone that's not enlightened, what it's like. And it's like, 
you just got to got to go through it. And it's like, okay, well, there's got to be some sort of bridge to say, okay, like here's kind of like generally what this stuff is like. So that way you don't get screwed so you can get what you want. Right. Like, that's that's where I think it's incumbent on us in our leadership roles. I don't want to say CEO, right. In our leadership roles to seek out mentors, to seek out professionals that can complement us and not allow us to make mistakes, sort of obvious mistakes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so my, my gut says, and whoever's listening would be, don't try to do this. Don't try this at home, kids. You know, like, you know, uh, um, I just didn't really have much to lose. And some part of this will be illuminated by getting into this sort of the deal structure. So one of the things I was acutely aware of in, in my transaction was that Steve didn't have the money to buy me. Um, I cared about the cash component, not the stock. How did, you, how did you figure that out? Because I knew Steve for three years. He was my distributor. He was the head of my distributor. So I knew him. All right. And, and, and he knew me in terms of an operating basis, not as a financial on the financial side or whatever, but I knew he needed to raise money, but he was willing to sign something that he'll close kind of quickly. But I didn't want to give free, free due diligence to my Canadian distributor who will then know everything about me. And I lose my leverage to, to sort of talk, communicate or negotiate on a day-to-day -day basis, forget on a transactional basis with him as a, that, right. So if everything is as I say it is, then what will it be? Because I was always super diligent in my in my digital organization of files, you know, in, you name it. I'll jump ahead here for a second. Like when they gave me the due diligence checklist, it, I was begging, like, just keep it simple, man. Just tell me what you need to see or whatever, and I'll do it. And sure enough, I was actually in Chicago in, in, in mid-January uh, on a sales call. And, and so while I'm in Chicago, literally to do my Walgreens meeting, which is very important to me or whatever, I happened to get, uh, I think it was a 17 page due diligence checklist. And I called, and I'm like, immediately, I didn't even call because I was, I didn't want to be distracted or whatever. And I said, fuck, the one thing I asked this guy not to do, he did, which was a generic 17 page. It wasn't specific in any way, like generic due diligence checklist. But I'm in Chicago. I'm like, okay, I'll get back to that a couple days from now, you know, whatever, I'll, I'll get back to it. And the long and the short of it is when I sat down to do it, I was able to create my own data room with specificity. So if it was section 3.6 on their due diligence checklist of docs, then that's what it said in my, it, it was a perfect data room. And when I got back to Miami and I call him, he's like, well, when do you want to review the checklist, David? Cause he was very aware that I was saying, don't give me a big general checklist, whatever. And I said, Steve, what are you talking about? You haven't checked your email. You already have it all turned around while I was in Chicago doing something much more important than this, which was, you know, trying to have a good Walgreens meeting. Anyway, so, so What's his response to that. It set the tone and it, first of all, it reinforced that whatever I'm going to say to you, you're going to see, there's no trickery here. There's no, it is full transparency. And if the words are coming out of my mouth, that's what you're going to see. And what that did, and especially the speed in which I turned it around, even on a subconscious level, it had to have set a tone from a diligence perspective, because whether it was them or the, the, they had Deloitte do the diligence on us and all that, whatever they were asking for was just, it was so readily available, easy. Here you go. There was always an explanation for a question. It didn't take me time to do it. Whatever docs they wanted was right there. So when I backed up the, the walk with the talk or whatever the, the, the phrasing yeah, is yeah. that really, I think even on a subconscious level, just streamlined this whole process because there wasn't, anything that it came up as a question like and i and this was not an asset sale this was a, a sale of the company so can you imagine yeah. you know with, and this this whole transaction had extremely limited to almost none in terms of reps warranties and indemnification provisions so to a, for a stock sale to a toronto publicly traded company with no audited financials with no audited financials and and literally just flew through it but it was because I was that tight. I was that organized. And whatever words were coming out of my mouth was what they were seeing by way of, you know, whenever they were getting the diligence request. How many of your friends that are entrepreneurs can do that? I don't think many, but, but because we're not focused on shit like that and we run around with our heads cut off. I'll tell you the lack of financial literacy with some rock star entrepreneurs that I know is amazing to me. Like, I don't even know how that's possible. Um, but better luck. you good. Well, and the only reason I laughed is because so now out of 300 and some people that have been through our online training, David, in the last 18 months, we have dozens, like plural, dozens of entrepreneurs going, hey, been through that training, love it. Can you create a financial literacy boot camp that teaches us how all this shit works? And I'm like, 
And literally financial literacy, the amount of times I've heard that in the last couple of years is amazing. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, like it's crazy. You know, wait, you know, what, like I, I asked, I was at a presentation a couple of weeks ago. I said, raise your hand if you can see and predict the distributions and taxes you're going to have over the next 12 months. Zero hands went up. Yeah. You know, go figure, right? But anyway, so I, ju- I jump ahead there. I jump ahead there. And that was sort of an important thing. And I would definitely say be prepared. It's one of like, like my big sort of takeaways, which is you never know when you're going to get an unsolicited term sheet. You're never going to know when they're going to say yes to your, to your structure, to what you're proposing to do by way of a transaction. And the more buttoned up and tight you are, the easier it is to get through tax season, the easier it is to get through a transaction, the easier it is to get through regulatory you know, situations, whatever the case might be. Right. And so it serves you well. If you look at my actual work desk, I'm not so organized. But if you look at my myself digitally, I'm very organized. When you said it's all there and you said it sets the tone. So then how did the sequence of events unfold after that? So what was very important to me, because I knew Steve didn't have the money to do it, but he was willing to commit to a faster timeline. And I wasn't a fan of giving him, uh, you know, free diligence because that does require me to put time, real time effort work. I don't want my brain wandering and, 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 and imagining these amazing scenarios because that's where a lot of people get tripped up. You think that you sign a term sheet, you're even discussing the terms and your brain's already thinking about like the sale and the exit and like, ooh, I'm going to be a millionaire and all these things. And, and so you start to give in and say yes to a lot of things because you've already sort of manifested or thought through that outcome of, yeah, I'm going to sell for a lot of money, right? And that can get you into a lot of trouble when you're sort of taking in sports, right? The, the, the hardcore coaches say, I don't care about week 17 in the NFL. I care about week 14 right now. And, and then I'll care about week 15 and then I'll care about week 16, you know, play at a time, play by play. Correct. Right. Like that's the only thing. Right. So, but putting it all together and again, understanding where each side was coming from, I knew Steve needed to do a deal because I was the core thing for him. I knew that I was going to easily be able to take back my contract with him. Although I never threatened it, never came up, you know, or anything like that. Uh, and I knew that he wasn't making enough money. So as a default and as a backup, kind of what precipitated it is that the buy sell arrangement that we had, he needed it to get it. He needed to be able to get the product closer to my cost of goods. Right. And I, I had a much lower gross margin on him because I was selling to another market and, and, and needing to let him have money, but he couldn't make money straight up as a distributor and supporting the brand and all this stuff in that country. But I wasn't making a lot of money either. And so going into the term sheet, knowing that there was a very high probability, like how is he going to raise this much money and, and, and get this transaction done or closed by a two month within a two month time frame or less, right? If he doesn't do that, I still want to address his needs. His needs is, is to be able to buy on a variable basis. He needed to be able to buy it closer to my cost of goods. My cost of goods would say about 50 cents a shot. He was buying it for me for a dollar. And he took the currency, the currency spread risk. Um, because I only transacted in, in US dollars. It didn't really matter where the Canadian dollar was to me. So I knew he needed to get closer to me. I knew I wasn't making a lot of money. I, I wanted to, I was sort of thinking about a potential fundraising round or whatever. And for me, what I came up with was I will basically, if he gives me X amount of gross dollars, which was basically kind of my projected gross profit off of him for the next three years, if he front loads that to me today, I will sell to him at a cost plus 10 or 20%. Because then I was able to do some back end, you know, some non dilutive. How he yeah. was going to pay for the – if he's literally just purchasing an asset. Like well, he was purchasing the right to buy it from me at a – it was a, through a licensing arrangement. He was purchasing the right to have it from me for three or five years at a at, – at close to my cost. So if, it, 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 I think it was cost plus 20%. So if it cost me 50 cents, I was selling it to him at 60 versus a dollar. Now he had a lot more upside margin that he can invest behind and go. So it, it sort of helped – bridge financing relative to Canada, it, it, it accomplished a lot. So when we did the term sheet, the term sheet was plan A, sell the company to him. Plan B was we'll execute a licensing arrangement like uh, akin to what I just described, right? Yeah. From me, these dollars, it was a, a non-dilutive financing round for me. So I was going to say, yeah. So it's also satisfying one of your needs too, which is more capital. Correct. Up front, because I was in the process of trying to build out my digital ecosystem and so I want to do a lot more by, by way of building up my, you know, how we looked online. I was like, great, this is a way to get some cash today to do that. You know, so, so again, this is the idea that I was listening. So I, I actually set up in the term sheet, two transactions. It was plan A, sell, plan B, 
uh, licensing arrangement to still give him what he wanted, which was a better cost of goods so that he can invest behind the brand, which is also always going to be accretive to me uh, in Dreamwater. Um, the other thing I did was I took upfront dollars and that was not negotiable. I think that the upfront there was a couple hundred thousand dollars, but it was one hundred thousand dollars of what I said was, listen, I got to start spending money on diligence and on lawyers and stuff on day one. If this doesn't you happen, you pay for your due diligence and all this shit. Hell yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> I love it, dude. That's what most that's what most bankers say. But but for me, it, it wasn't even a weird thing. I just said, look, I'm going to incur transactions. Logic, like you said, just like you were saying, like this logically yeah. makes sense to me. If you this everybody it? everybody will say, oh, I'm spending money on my own attorneys. I'm spending money on my account. Yeah, but until they write a check to you, they don't have skin in the game. I'm sorry. The reason that in Wall Street they call it dead deal fees, right? Because like the shit doesn't always go through. No, and I don't want to have to go get it after the fact either. I want it in my bank account because I'm spending that those dollars today, and I'm taking my time today. And then the second hundred thousand in that upfront payment upon signing of the term sheet, that second hundred thousand was an advance against the licensing deal, right? And so what I did right up front was change the table stakes a little bit. Again, keep in mind, I was paying attention to what all the stakeholders in this in this transaction needed or what I thought they needed by way of asking questions or being transparent with what my needs were, such that when I made those requests, it wasn't like the weirdest request in the world, right? Um, and You were solving your needs. And then I, I positioned it where they had actual skin in the game. And I can tell you that my transaction probably only ever came to fruition because of those upfront dollars. I won't do a transaction, you know, right now I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of working on a transaction for my, uh, my family's cannabis business, uh, independent of this, right? And uh, it's a sticking point. And the acquirer is like, I don't, but I'm like, dude, when you're talking about a nine figure transaction, I'm not asking for that much fucking money. And if you're not willing to pay that to me right now, that's a, that's an indicator, you know, like that's what I need to know. Yeah. Every banker will laugh me out of the room if I say things like that, you know, but, but again, for me, it, for me, at least, it was such a consequential part that I completely attribute the transaction actually closing to it. So what happens? Well, it, well, it, well, it, well, let me pause you right there because I find it so fascinating from a psychology perspective, David, because, well, first of all, you got the sunk cost fallacy. So you got a buyer that's already proven that they've committed, which is also like every professional service firm that does a, an assessment prior to engagement. That's the whole reason that they do that. But you've got the buyer doing that. And let's unpack like why investment bankers probably don't like this. Well, because their deals just get shit done, get deals done. And they're going to go, they're trying to win a client and sell the client at the same time. And that's a huge friction point that like the art of like the stakes are not that high for them because of the volume game where it's so high for you that it's worth asking for. And they probably want to have a better relationship with it. If we're being honest, they probably want to have a better relationship with the acquirer than they do with you. You're a one-off transaction. That acquirer might be an acquirer for the following company, the following brand. Who knows? They might become their selling client because they had a good experience with you as a banker. I love it. I love it. Am I wrong, Ryan? No, you're not, man. I I love it. Well, honestly, so like our old industry, dude, we had these investment bankers. Like, oh, it's the copier dealer investment bankers. I'm like, they work for Canon and Konica. Like, if we don't sell to them, they're going to take our freaking list and our pricing and all of our shit. And they're going to get out of Canon and go, well, Imaging Pad didn't want to sell. Let's go to this company. I mean, it's like, dude, they don't work for us at all. That's right. That's the dirty little thing. I say the same thing about, you know, brokers and sales reps into the trade. You think that they're working for you? No, they work for their relationship. Yeah. By the way, I don't begrudge anybody in this equation for doing that. That is just, the lifeblood of their business. It's 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 how the systems are structured. Dude, that's awesome. I, so I just had to put a pause here because that's a, that's fantastic. So going back to the deal structures, as you so now you got them paying for your due diligence. What what's it like going through the due diligence deal structure? How does like what's the the let's see if we can find the the sequence? So again, I was ready for it. When they sent me something, it didn't matter what I had going on. I sent it right back. So the timing, the the proficiency, the transparency, the the correctness of it sets the right tone, right? But remember how I told you that the deal heated up in mid-March through start of May, right? That's when the core of the thing was. So when you're going through a deal, like I didn't hire my attorney. I didn't put my attorney on this right away because I said, let's see it progress. Let me get some docs from them, you know, or... You know, let's see what happens because I knew he was on spec. He was trying to go out and raise the money. So whatever. Long and the short of it is I don't feel the deal coming to fruition. I don't feel it happening. And so even though in my heart of hearts, I'm like, he's got a week left. He's got two weeks left. He'll get it done. He always does whatever. February 15 rolls around. 
and it's my birthday. I'm actually going to my monthly EO meeting. It happened to be that day. And again, that day could have been amazing. I had my EO meeting. It was my birthday. It was one of those, it was setting up to be beautiful, but instead on my drive in the, it was a, a, a morning meeting, uh, a morning four hour meeting on my drive there. I'm talking to Steve and Steve's like, you got to give me two more weeks. You, you got to give me a little bit of time. We're going to get this thing done. It's going to happen. And it's going to be all these things. And I said, Steve, it's okay, man. It's okay. We thought about this already. Remember, we've already negotiated the entire licensing structure. Steve, let's just, let's just go, go do that. I mean, we, we knew this was a possibility, right? Enough that we had an entire plan B, literal plan B. Like this was the plan. So let's just do that. Now, you have to understand, in, in psychology, is a huge part of this, right? I'm glad you referenced it like that because inside, on my drive to my meeting, all I wanted to do was say, woo, what an amazing day, right? And inside, I'm like, fuck, 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 right? But I would be calm as a cucumber or whatever the right term is. Yeah, Steve right. is fine. We thought about this already. But mind you, part of what's hurting him is that he had a lot of money already at stake yeah. against yeah. it, right? And, and, and he didn't really want to do the licensing deal. He wanted to buy me. And I knew that. So there's nothing I can do. And then, and then throw on David the, I don't know if you've ever been through Sandler sales train or anything like it, the reverse sell where you're like, Oh no, no dude, it's fine. You know, we, maybe we'll just, we'll just put it on pause and then people want you more. <laughs> it's just well, that's not a small thing. Right. And so then the long and the short of it is he goes, I need more time. And I say, how much more time do you need? He says a month. I say, this was, wasn't all on that call. Maybe it was like a day or two later. I say, okay, Steve, I'll tell you what. You need a month? I'll charge you $100,000 for that extra month. And, and why $100,000? Because it was a nice round number that they should say yes to. Remember, that I already have two in my pocket, although it was conditioned, right? It was for transaction costs, and it was for an advance against my licensing deal and retainer. And by the way, at that point, he already said, I don't want to do a licensing deal. I want to buy you, right? He was very adamant about that. So I said, okay. He goes, well, wait, I might need two months, he tells me. I said, I'll tell you what, Steve. Why don't we execute an extension? You get $100,000 until March 15th. And if you need the extension, it's on you. You pay another $100,000, you get an extension until April 15th. Does that work for you? Yes. I get wired the, the $100,000, you know, for the one-month extension. Oh, and I did one more thing. I said, Remember how that was a, a, an upfront payment against my licensing deal and all that? Now, all of the, that initial $200,000 is now earned by me free and clear. It's not against a transaction and it's not against nothing. That $200,000, I've already earned outright. So and give me a hundred, another hundred grand. And give me another hundred thousand. Dude, so every single person listening to this is, you know, okay, so does David do investment banking or deal structures as an attorney? <laughs> they, they, they can absolutely reach out to me because I think, I think I'm kind of good at this. And if I can close this transaction I'm working on right now, then I would say, yes, you should absolutely call me for all of your, all of your <laughs> banking or, or structuring needs uh, and negotiating needs. So I did that. And, and, then, and then sure enough, you know, we're getting to, but see, at the start of March, I, I, Deloitte started to really show up. You started having the occasions like this thing is heating up. And I should say as a backdrop to this whole thing, my father, who was basically like the de facto chairman of, of, of my company, at every step of the way was telling me, again, be careful listening to the experts or the professionals. He was like, there's no fucking way this deal is going to happen. It, it's never going to happen, David. It's never going to happen, David. And when I would walk in and say, I just did this, it got to the point where my dad was laughing. My dad was literally I would say, but look, I got another hundred thousand and my dad would, and my dad is not that kind of guy. And he would just uncontrollably laugh and he would oh, still yeah, tell no, me. No, Cause it's just like, it's just not normal. So I'm laughing because I'm just like, dude, I've been doing this shit for almost eight years now. And this is the first I've heard of any of these. But my dad kept telling me it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. I said, bah. even if it doesn't happen, because by the time I got the, 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 the second payment, right. In March 15th, so now I had 400000 free and clear. I said, pa, in the worst case scenario, congratulate me. I, I just made the most profitable $400,000 I've ever made ever. It was against zero cost because I was able to handle the diligence. I was able to handle the legal up until that point. I had literally no expenditures, no cost against it. And then when and I really the deal up, fall apart, if the deal falls apart, you get more capital. <laughs> if the deal falls apart, I have four hundred thousand dollars. It wasn't going to an escrow account. No, it was just coming to my the licensing. But and the licensing deal for more capital. So like, yes, like, yeah, yes, 
sauce. Wait, so then, so then uh, I layer in my attorney. Even my own attorney was like debating me. And I said, Jamie, this guy, Jamie Hurwitz, stop fucking debating me. Just don't fuck this up. You just need to paper it, which I was still very much involved in. But like, you know, he would handle that or whatever. And even at one point, Jamie, who was very always like pessimistic as well. And I was like, whatever. He was like, whatever you say goes. I, I am I am on board with you. I turned around with him and I said, I don't want to deal with hourlies. I don't want to deal with hourlies. Charge me a rate. Charge me a fixed amount because I didn't have a war chest of cash. I didn't have a lot of cash, positive cash flow. I really wanted those 400 grand. Why? To finance what I was trying to do in my digital ecosystem, right? Let's still be clear about that. Mm-hmm. That is what I was proceeding with. That profitability really helped me, you know, to get there. And so I didn't want to be, you know, I didn't want to be frivolous. I didn't want to also incur a bunch of costs that if the deal doesn't close, well, shit, out of the 400 grand I just put in my pocket, I have to give him half, you know, whatever it was, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, so we progressed this thing. And, and, and at that point, mid-March and on, it really did feel like we're, we're working toward a close here. My own personal employment agreement, I had negotiated and stripped away everything from this purchase agreement, like I said before. Basically, no indemnification, no reps and warranties, and it was a straight-up stock sale, like not – not a, a, a an asset sale where they still were comfortable that there was no contingent liabilities, that there was no unforeseen bullshit, or that I didn't not disclose something important. How, I was going to say, like, and that that's a crucial part of that over the years on the show, I keep hammering home because the more work you get, like when we talk about like barely anybody does this, the clean cleanliness of all the stuff that you had buttoned up, that's what allows you to increase your probability of getting a stock sale because all of the, I mean, them buying the EIN number and all of the potential liabilities. I mean, like, dude, the amount of shit that could go wrong. Yeah. You must have had to mit- mitigate their concerns so much by being able to get done what you got done. I mean, that, like, which is the idea of being prepared and clean and transparent, right? And, and responsive. It didn't take me a month to turn this shit around. It was whatever you want. Here you go. There was always a very clear, detailed logical and reasonable explanation for any question that they had not sales meeting not negotiating whatever then we get to april 15th and as we're getting to april 15th remember they had to close by april 15th and i told you that we announced the deal on may 3rd the guys are clearly working on it so this time i believe but they're not there and you know jamie my own attorney is asking what are you going to do man i say what do you think i'm going to do i'm going to ask him for another hundred thousand dollars for another month and Jamie's like, you can't, you can't, you can't. Okay, Jamie, you know what? Is it purely because purely he was uncomfortable with Yes. That? So I said, okay, Jamie, for you, I'll give him two weeks for free. So I gave him to the end of April, right? So by the way, my attorney is asking me to do this for free because otherwise he would have been uncomfortable. <laughs> and it's okay. You got you to gotta empower the people around you or yourself to have areas to give in on, Right. Because that's that that way they feel that they're winning, that they're getting something or whatever. And you want to set these things up in a way where you know where you can give in and not or whatever. But at that point, I really said, well, I have $400,000. I'm good, right? Like, you know, even if I don't get anything else, let them try to close the transaction. I had beaten them up so much in terms of the language and the, and the, and the text of the purchase agreement that I very openly told them, I will not do this in my own employment agreement. Because even though the entirety of the terms of my employment were already negotiated into the term sheet, I said to them, I will not fuck up this deal for me to make three, four, five hundred thousand dollars, whatever it was, right? Maybe four or five hundred thousand. I will not fuck this up, right? Like, don't worry. They only handed me my employment agreement, the first draft, on on the last day of April or May 1. Remember, it was so so I didn't push that hard. It just I was very clear on what mattered and what didn't, even though it was subjugating me toward you know something else and what have you. And there's a whole background on there, but that was very important too, that again, I was setting it up. So like, don't expect another battle. The battle was already done. I cared about my shareholders first and foremost. And that was true all the way through, including th- that I didn't really negotiate my, my thing, which I, I got my employment agreement, right. Except for one thing um, that I, that I would have loved to have gone back and closed the loop on, but that, did, that didn't end up mattering so much. And then I will say this just by, by getting it done. They were telling me that uh, they needed the one month, they needed the month of May to get the Toronto Stock Exchange to approve because you cannot own cannabis or CBD assets or sort of any, any sort of cannabis assets and trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange 
if those cannabis assets are where it's not federally legal. So if it's in Canada where it's federally legal, you can you can trade. If it's in the U.S., you cannot trade in, in the Toronto Stock Exchange. You can trade on the Canadian Stock Exchange, but you can't trade on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Oh. And so that the Toronto Stock Exchange needed to approve. And then I said, but wait a second. You're going to announce this transaction on, on May 2nd. Remember the time? You're going to announce this transaction. I sell to Walmart, Walgreens, Target, Publix, Kroger, you know, Safeway. You name it. I do not. My whole thing was I don't want to announce this publicly because I don't want to run the risk that Walgreens or CVS calls me and says, pick up your shit. You cannot. You have to. It was a different moment in time. It wasn't that long ago, but it was a different moment in time relative to where cannabis, you know, sentiments are or were or what have you. And, and even on the CBD side and, and all that stuff. So, see, they were like, people were all hot and bothered about CBD in 2017, 2018. Yes. Yeah. And so, like, I mean, I can't imagine. <clears throat> well, what was it? Okay, when was the whole cigarette thing going on with CVS and Walgreens? And with the vapes? Like, well, it, well, there was the vapes, but it was also they, they, were, they yanked all tobacco products. Yeah. Look, I, it was, it was, it was, was a lot going on. It was in the last couple of years. But the point is, right? So, I was definitely afraid. That's the reason why I never, I had CBD. THC products locked in before people even heard the word CBD. Back in 2014, 15, I was already there because sleep is a very important medical need state that gets solved for, or at least is a huge part of the, sleep and anxiety are the big parts of the medical conversation around um, cannabis, right? And so I was already there and all those things, whatever. But when it comes to deal terms and structures, remember I gave them the two weeks to get to the end of April, but when I'm seeing that that's going to go and I said, fuck, this is... This is a scary proposition. And for some reason, I feel like I had an extra 100,000. And by that point, I think I was up to like 500 grand. I forget exactly why. But then I said to them, you want an extra month to report? We are done with the goddamn trans effectively, right? And my guy, Jamie Hurwitz, is yelling at me. You cannot ask them for more money. I said, Jamie, I gave them the two weeks for free in April. They want the month of May. I'm charging them $100,000. And mind you, it was coming to the company. So I said, guys, close whenever you want. You get your money back. It wasn't as an offset to the purchase price. Okay, okay. But I was like, listen, guys, it's, com- it's not coming to David like I just sitting in the company. I'm using it for company purposes. Whenever you want to get it back, just close on the transaction. We're good, right? <laughs> and so, and so um, I asked them for another one. And then there was one aspect on my balance sheet that I said, if you were ever going to clean up this bill from forever ago, that you, you're going to want to clear up because that law firm from this litigation from years ago is going to want to collect when they see that there's dollars to be collected because the acquirer had money. I said, if you're ever going to want to resolve it, you should let me resolve it now prior to anything. And it was like a $250,000 bill that I actually settled for 125,000 bucks. So they wired me the hundred and then they wired me the 125 right before closing. They wired me those things so I can have the hundred for me, the 125 to knock off a $250,000 item on my balance sheet. So that was a $250,000 credit that if they didn't close by May 31, I just, the one freaking thing that I had on my balance sheet that wasn't even pressing to me was now fully resolved for 50 cents on the dollar. And I had even more money. So by the end of all of this, whether they closed with me or not, I had effectively about $750,000 worth of stuff. Again, it, it was 625 of cash and 125 of cleaning up my balance sheet. And so I had all that in place. Told you it was a good story, right? Oh, dude, this is freaking awesome. I've had just a blast listening. And uh, so as we're wrapping up here, a couple of mechanical questions on the deal structure, cash versus stock. I mean, what, what was the structure? I mean, how did, how did that work? And then um, the other question that I had is like, what was the joke? I don't know if you're familiar share, or you're comfortable sharing the joke that got you terrified that the deal might not close <laughs> now that we have more context of the deal. I just literally said, you overpaid for this, whatever this is. We didn't need to. I would have given it to you for a lot less. I would have given it to you for a lot less. I literally made a joke like that. And, uh, and he, he started, the lawyer, this guy Aaron, started the board meeting by saying, I told you, board, we were paying too much for this and, and, and whatever, whatever. So I gave him the ammo you know, to, try to, to try to renegotiate or fuck me or whatever. And, and the, the, the only thing I really, really cared about was the cash component, which was about 14 to 15 million US. Um, so it's more than that in Canadians. And because the stock piece, first of all, I use the stock to settle up other pieces of the, of the transaction, like with Steve and, and so on and so forth, because Steve basically traded it to the company that bought me. So, so the way Steve structured it on his side, it wasn't Steve. It was this company, Harvest One, that bought me. Um, and so 
you know, the stock was more used for that or for other considerations. What I will tell you that was very important to me as part of my deal structure, and 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 this is of note where I, I say, let's talk about gratitude real quick. When we and when I announced that deal, that video that I showed you when I was in the room, I did say to them, guys, you know, I tried to level set expectations. Don't count money. Don't assume anything. Don't look for another job. We don't know until this thing closes. And that's so true, right? Like my stupid joke at literally midnight, the day of the transaction, literally almost fucked it up for me. Okay. And so it's not facetious when people say to you, it ain't done until it's done. And if you have extended reps and warranties and indemnifications, which is very standard in a lot of these deals, it ain't done until that expires, just for whatever it's worth, right? Until, yeah, until you're out of that. And all that shit that you can, you might have some of your money, but like you got to, right. yeah. yeah. Or any holdback, you can already assume, you know, in a, in a very overly simplistic way, any amount of money that is held back from you, they will find ways to not pay it to you. By and large, some people do. I'm not saying this as a 100% statement, but general theme, though. Is yes, right. general theme. So at that meeting, again, I had very limited reps and warranties that were all tied to my knowledge between the announcement date on May 3rd and closing on or before May 31. And what I should have done because of that was gone on a three week vacation, which I more than earned and deserved. I probably didn't do it because I have little kids at home, right? And I didn't want to leave them for three. I never, I've never done that in their whole lifetime. And so, and so I didn't, I was literally in the office that day, the next day, I didn't even take a day from not being in the office. Got so, stuff to do. Go back to the to-do list. Right? But, but, no, but, but not really, because again, that was a stupid move on my part. I should have left because then I really wouldn't know anything. But what I did was I told everybody, if I come to you and ask you any question about the business, do not answer me, even if it's a good response, because then I'm going to, you might be tempted to tell me negative things that I don't want to know. And if there's something that is really, really terrible, I said, go to my younger brother, Joseph, tell him and heal the side if I need to know it or not, right? And so I set up those parameters knowing what that meant in my negotiations. But what I did do in those three weeks is, or at least for a part of those three weeks, is um, write letters of appreciation. So one of the things that I did that was core in that term sheet that they tried to renegotiate away from me several times was that I negotiated a pool of funds that was to be used at my discretion for whoever I wanted to say thank you to. Nothing to do with an option pool. It wasn't for my shareholders. I could have taken it all for myself because there was no restrictions or limitations on that. But it was literally a pool of a tangible pool of money where I substantially tried to get everybody to one year's salary mm-hmm. as a thank you uh, gift. And even the, the 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 maintenance crew that I had coming, you know, once or twice, twice, twice a week at night, that I would see them sometimes because I was still the last one there at night. Even my, you know, some contractors, you know, like basic stuff. They all got at least say a thousand bucks, you know, just something, but they got that plus a letter, a letter from me that no, nobody's letter was more than a page long. And I'm a very verbose person, but it was very, it was meant to be like, Hey, you're going to get this much money, right? Um, it wasn't like, here's a check, but you're going to get this much money out of the transaction. And I gave the letters on the day that I was wired the money. So like when it actually closed, but it was also around, um, uh, it was really around, this is what you meant to me in my process and in my journey of dream water. And, and so some people was longer, some people was a lot shorter, but, but all of that happened. And um, I will tell you that sharing it, you know, with my father and my uncles, sharing it with some of my key shareholders and sharing it with my EO group and sharing it most of all with the, the people that I mean, it wasn't all employees. There were some advisors that never expected anything. My employees didn't expect anything. They didn't have, they weren't in the money really on their options. They weren't in whatever, they weren't even expecting it, but I had like, I was very close to my, one of my heads of sales and his wife came into the office crying just to hug me, you know, like, or whatever. Cause I don't think that they realized what I was telling them that they were about to get. And for people like that, you know, a year's worth of salary, they were like, they didn't know what to do. You know, they were just like, wow, that's a game changer. I remember asking my data analyst, she was there late with me. I think that day that we announced and I said, Hey Kim, what would, what would be like an amazing thank you bonus that I can give you or, or a gift? And she goes like one month's worth of rent. And I was like, well, how much is that for you? She's like two grand. I was like, I was like, oh, but you've got to think a little bit bigger. And she goes, and she goes two months worth of rent. She got, she got an entire year's worth of rent or more, you know, like, like no more two years worth of rent, you know, like that so well, you get what I'm saying? salary. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It was just, I was very important for me and the choir, tried to renegotiate that away from me several times. And it was just a straight no. There was no, there was no wiggle room there. That, that would have been an easy thing for me to give back, but it was important for me 
not just to use words, but to actually have something. It wasn't a huge amount of money, you know, on a relative basis, but it was something to say, thank you. And, and, and I appreciate you. And there's, so a, there's actually an exercise in, uh, in our five principles of the intentional growth. The first one is your personal drivers. We call it the stakeholder exercise. And it's about forcing people to put on a paper what the different stakeholders mean to them. Why was that so important to you, David? Because it wasn't me. It wasn't just me. It was a cumulative experience. And I guess in the dynamics of what we had, I was kind of always the elder statesman um, in Dreamwater. I mean, later on in the process, there were people that were older than me. But the core of always Dreamwater was I was the old guy. Uh, my younger brother started with me kind of right out of Babson at 22, 23, ended up becoming my head of sales. My, uh, my Vincent, my co-founder, was probably a couple years older than him. You know, when he, when he, he was probably 26, 27 when he started with me. I was, no, so he was probably 25 when he started with me. So we were all, we were all growing up together. We were living together, sleeping together. I don't mean sexually. I mean, like, you know, like we, a lot of us were roommates. No, we were roommates. Like we literally lived together. Right. And in the office and, you know, it's just one of those things that we did it together and to pretend that we didn't or to not acknowledge that we didn't would have not been right by me. Um, we, we grew and we grew up in life together. I look even to this day, I'm still friends with these people that maybe not all of them even lived in Miami and we still connect and I see their kids and I'm like, oh my God, they're like huge humans now, you know, or whatever. And I'm like, it's just so wild to me. And my goal, and I would say this in a lot of meetings also was we all created our own jobs at Dreamwater. We really did. And it's starting with me. And my goal for everybody was simply to just be better off for having had the Dreamwater journey and experience in their lives than not. And, and while I think that that was very true and I could have left it there, I could have, I could have, I was very clear that that did happen for literally everybody in this equation. I needed to say thank you. And I would have done it out of my own money if I didn't have it, you know, because I, I needed to do that for me. David, this has been so fun, man. I like, honestly, like so happy we split it into two. I have uh, had more fun on this than most of the shows, man. And, so because I already asked you in the last session, the, you know, what is intentional meaning your contact information? You know, I think other than trying to like come up with something monumental, like think about like the listeners in are typically a very similar to your EO forum. Like what would you have for like maybe one last, you know, parting comments to someone that hasn't been through all this, you know, how to think about all this Any any parting comments? I mean, I think we touched on it, um, Ryan. I think, I think that, you want to find ways to compliment yourself, right? So whether it's the technical side with accountants and lawyers, um, whether it's through mentorship and somebody who's been there, done that, it could be in your own groups like EO, or it could be because you know somebody around the way. Hell, I'll say it again. My email is david.lekach, L-E-K-A-C-H at gmail.com. Um, I'm on Instagram, david.lekach. Um, just reach out to me. I mean, I'm, I'm volunteering Right. If you have a, a deal, a deal structure, a question or whatever, reach out to people like me. Worst case scenario, I say no. Best case scenario, I say, OK, here you go. And I give you one nugget um, and you combine that with your own thoughts and, and, and what have you. And and and, you know, you'll get it done. Don't be overwhelmed by this. Um, you know, I think, Ryan, you give too much credit to the academic side of it. And the truth is, you know, let's call the academic side the way it should be done. If I did things the way they should be done. I don't know that I would have ever closed this transaction. I don't know that I would have had anything to show for it, by the way, because most people will tell you, you can't ask for money. You were laughing at me, right? And it's not just you, Ryan. Everybody laughs at me when I say these things, when I tell this story, this part of the story. Like, it's so absurd and weird for people. Well, and-, and On your own race. Yes, and I will, I, will, I will say that I agree with your comments. I feel like this weird out-of-body experience right now that I'm being told that I'm being too academic or giving too much academic- credibility credit but what's so interesting because i was a copier salesperson i didn't know any of this shit when we did our deal and the reason we got our deal done is because of that and it's so crazy <laughs> that now i'm back on the other side i'm like i gotta do some serious reflecting tonight going like okay like how, have we gone that far as a pendulum swing that far but i think you bring so many good points to it dude it, like what we want is we want people to get confidence to get what they want that's it you know what i mean and it's I, I had no academic background, which gave me like the reason that I'm a little jaded with our experiences. Is I feel like I didn't know certain things that I should have. And so, but like, but what I hope that people take from it is that 
the more stuff that they might technically know, then they can write their own script and, you know, sing their own song. But can we copy that real quick before we hang up? Let's copy that for a second. You could be your own worst enemy. If you, if you know too much, or even if you think you don't, right? Like I'm a novice and I don't know what I don't know. And I'm all nervous or whatever. The key that I find is ask questions and be transparent. I don't negotiate with this idea that I'm going to get you. I'm going to win. I'm very clear on the fact that I have to make sure that I'm meeting your needs And you're oftentimes not going to tell me what those are. I have to get that out of you. So more than anything is ask the right questions and listen, which if you know me, you're probably laughing. Like, how the hell is David Lekach telling me to listen? He's the worst listener in the world. But maybe sometimes I'm not. And and if I can get you talking, I'm processing that. And that is how I structure the deal. That is how these things come to me. Have you ever uh, read Never Split the Difference with Chris Voss? No, but I oh, believe you, 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 he, he was on my podcast and I'll, and then I'll wrap it up for the listeners. Yeah. But he was on my podcast. He was the lead ne- international terrorist negotiation ne- negotiator for the FBI. He's the whole book is about how to do what you're talking about. So it's a great reference for the listeners. If they wanted to unpack further, dude, David, thank you so much for the few hours you spent with me, man. And hopefully the listeners are, uh, are, uh, have got a lot of takeaways, man. I've very much appreciated the time. I hope you captured my good side. I did, man. Thanks so much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, listeners.